Ingra and I are going to be presenting the epidemiology of pain. Okay, so we have two main words, epidemiology, pain. Um, while this is a pain didactic, I want to make sure that we understand what epidemiology means. Uh, let me just ask you, uh, I'm curious, how many of you feel confident that you know the definition of epidemiology? So this is worthwhile. Okay. Epidemiology is the branch of medicine that deals with the study of the distribution causes and control of disease in populations. Now, would you be happy if I just went on from there to the next slide? Let's break this down. Let's break down this definition with an example and uh, see to help us understand what epidemiology is. Let's look at the AIDS epidemic. Um, in 1981, um, people were coming down with weird cases of pneumonia, Kaposi's coma, and the CDC did not know what was happening. They sent out their intelligence uh, doctors, and the first thing you do when you're investigating an, an, epidem an epidemic is look at the distribution of the disease. Distribution is very important, and actually in this lecture, didactic, we're going to be focusing on the distribution part of epidemiology. Who has it? Who doesn't have it? Um, what they found were, was that most people who had it were homosexuals. Go ahead. There's a comment. Uh, the main vector was a pilot, not a pilot, but a male stewardess that flew weekly from New York to L.A. So he spread it in both ends of the, of the country. Right. In oh. so, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything is fine. Okay. So the distribution, we're looking at proportions. The proportion of homosexuals who had it was way greater than non-homosexuals. It was predominantly homosexuals. Then we honed in further to see um, what were the characteristics of the homosexuals who had it versus the homosexuals who didn't have the disease. And that led us to um, indirect causes, even before we had identified HIV. There were certain behaviors that were associated with um, developing AIDS. And that led us to begin to control the disease by putting together a set of guidelines of safe sex. So before HIV was even found, the disease was, we started to control the disease. And epidemiology is not just an observational methodology. It's involved in the intervention as well. So if we were to have a, vac a trial of a vaccine, um, you would have subjects randomized to either the vaccine or a placebo. And then we again would look at distributions. What proportion of people with the vaccine developed AIDS and what proportion did not? And based on that, we could see whether we had something that could potentially be efficacious and be headed for the FDA. And this is really a narrow definition of epidemiology. It's not only a branch of medicine. It's a methodology that could be used for other areas as well. For instance, you might want to see whether birth order is associated with success. Do firstborns, are firstborns more likely to be successful than those of later birth orders? So you would see what is the success rate, the distribution, among people who are firstborn versus people who are of later birth orders. And the difference in those proportions would, would lead you to a to hypothesis of whether or not success is associated with, um, with birth order. Okay, so now let's turn our attention to pain. Um, and most of what we're going to be dealing with is chronic pain. Uh, in 2006, the National Center for Health Statistics conducted a survey and found that about a quarter of Americans, or 77 million, reported that they had a problem with pain that persisted for 24 hours in the month preceding the interview. Um, the, the group that was most likely to, that had the highest proportion of reported pain were those who were 45 to 64. They had 30 percent, 30 percent proportion. Those who were younger and older had a slightly lower 
um, proportion of people who had pain. Brenda, can I just comment? Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who heard a lot of the chatter in the media about the recent Institute of Medicine report that was just released in June, this number was confirmed that about 70 to 75 million adults have chronic pain. And so it's good to see that there's at least consistency between this rate in 2006 and... A third of the population, right? Um, it's really a quarter. We, there, there are over 300 million people in the United States. Um, and adults 45 to 64 are the ones that mainly have pain. Um, there are different types of pain. There's low back pain. Uh, the most prevalent is, low, is low, low back pain, which accounts for 25% um, of people experience low back pain in the past three months, according to this survey. Now, I, now that I'm say, I say in the past three months, um, the answers that you get and the prevalence that you get depends on how the question is worded. So you may see different percentages as we go along, and it could be true that in different populations there are different percentages, but the way you ask the question counts. Migraines and severe headaches come second, and then joint pain. So 15% of those who were questioned had experienced a migraine or severe headache in the past 18 months. And those who were between the ages of 18 and 44 were almost three times as likely as adults who were 65 or over to report these headaches. Could anybody tell me why you think that particular age group, 18 to 44, were the most likely to have migraines? Any possible reasons? Okay. Thanks. So in, uh, in women, could it be the yeah. hormones? Yeah, that, that's the one that I was thinking of. Um, the, the, this is the time that women, you know, are most hormonally affected. After 65, supposedly, they're less so. Um, okay, so we had back pain, we had headaches, and now we have knee pain, which is the most intense and severe pain of all joints. And the hospitalization rates for knee replacement um, increased by 90% um, from 1992 93 to 2003 2004 in those who were 65 or over. And as with most pain, uh, joint pain increases with age. And as with most pain, women report more severe pain than do men. Pain is not limited to the United States. A uh, Canadian survey of 500 households, so surveys could be telephone surveys, mail surveys, person to person, now email surveys. In that survey, 16% experienced pain within the preceding two weeks. Okay, it depends. So we had 20, we had about a quarter within the past four weeks, 16 in the, in the United States, 16% within the past two weeks. In a Swedish uh, survey, 33, 22% had continuous obvious pain, which is another way of saying chronic pain, and it was 30% in the Danish survey. So Lara was just talking about consistency over time with the report now. Here we see consistency across countries. So somewhere between 16 and 30 percent of people do suffer from chronic pain. It's really interesting to me that this data is from the 80s. So have they stopped, sir? I mean, we're a very interesting country in how we deal with pain. And so this is just interesting to me because this would be the current data from the 80s. Yes? Yes and no. Um, pain medicine, who knows when pain medicine became a certified, a, a, a subspecialty, an official subspecialty. But is it an official subspecialty in this country? No. In, in these countries, yeah. So, I mean, it's just interesting to me that right, but, uh, right. there's older data than our data. Right. The 26% was 2006. And so, yeah. it, you're right. You're right. 20 years old. Right. Is it that the cost of doing some of these large population-based studies has increased substantially and so you don't see the publication of these types of studies um, or large epidemiologic data sets interrogating them 
the ones they have in Scandinavia are quite costly. Would that have something to do with it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people go where the money is when they want to do when they want to do research. Right. Um, what the RFAs are telling you that they're looking for, and I don't know if they've been looking for more pain surveys. Um, so, okay, now, we'll, remember we're looking at distributions, epidemiology is distributions, we've looked at what happened in different countries, now we're going to Australia, and they also had a random telephone survey in, in Brisbane. Um, I don't know if you see the inconsistency in this slide. Uh, we've never changed it. But uh, there were, we started out with 500, they started out with 500 randomly chosen households. Now, in epidemiology, random is not haphazard. It's a very scientific term. There are rules for picking a random sample. You can say, well, I'm going to choose everyone whose last name begins with the letter F. Because you got, you might have a lot of Friedmans, Franks, uh, Feingolds. You might have more Jewish people with the letter F than with any other letter. So there are very strict rules on how to get a random sample, and the whole purpose of getting a random sample is that it, you want to maximize the likelihood that it's going to be representative of the pool from which it was drawn. Of the 500, 265 households agreed to, co to participate. Now, right there, an epidemiologist stops you and says, well, are these 265 representative of the 500? Well, a response rate of over 51% of over 50% is considered to be a good response rate. But you still have to find out whether these 265 are, are representative of the 500. Were these households more likely to have uh, a member who was in pain and therefore more interested in the in the survey or perhaps the opposite they the the if they were more likely to have a person in pain they didn't want to be bothered because they were in pain so there are methods which I won't go into to check whether these 265 are representative of the 500 those 265 accounted for 614 individuals when the household was the unit of analysis, um, 94 of the 265, or 35%, had at least one member with a pain condition, and 84, or 32%, had one person with a pain condition in the past two weeks. Again, you see the percentages are similar over and over again when we're talking about chronic pain. When the individual, beforehand the household was the unit that we looked at, when the individual was the unit that we looked at, 19% had a uh, pain condition and 16% had a pain condition within the last two weeks. Um, this shows you that the prevalence of pain increases with age. Um, why would you think that the prevalence of pain increases with age? Any, any? Hmm? Arthritis. Right, arthritis, degenerative conditions increase with age. Anything else? Hint. <coughs> We're talking about chronic pain conditions. If it's chronic, why would that make older people ha be more likely to have um, have a higher proportion? Why would we have a higher proportion of older people with chronic with chronic pain? The newborn can't have something chronic. Hmm? The newborn can't have something chronic. A newborn can't have and can't have a pre-existing condition, I guess, either. Um, it's chronic. Since it's chronic, no one ever, no one ever, you know, cured it, so you just add it. It's exactly. Chronic. You keep, the, pee, the pool keeps on growing. If it's chronic and you can't get rid of it, then a person who's over the age of 60, by the fact that he has lived, or she has lived longer, has had greater opportunity to develop a condition that she's not going to get rid of. So this is what the slide says. Um, the increased prevalence of chronic pain is due to the development of age-related painful degenerative conditions, for example, arthritis. The accrual of chronic pain patients, um, which keeps on adding to the prevalence of chronic pain. The lower, and then these poor old people have a lower likelihood of recovering from chronic pain. 
But it's not only the nature of the pain and, and the biology of the person. There are other aspects. Um, older people have a fatalistic point of view. No pain. What do you expect? That's part of life. You have to live with it. They also want to be good patients. They feel that they'll get better care if they don't whine and complain. So they don't want to whine and complain about their pain. And when they just have a certain amount of time with their doctor and they have a very serious disease, they don't want to distract the clinician from treating their cancer or their other infections, uh, other severe conditions. Um, with, 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 they don't want to distract them with the pain part of their condition. And so pain is undertreated and it really compromises um, quality of life. Um, within the past couple of years, my husband had a terrible eye infection, uh, which threatened he could have lost his vision. But he had excruciating pain, whether his eye was open or closed. And when we were at the ophthalmologist, I asked for a pain consult, being who I am and where I work. And uh, reluctantly, well, not reluctantly, actually, Dr. Portnoy, even though I was at Columbia, Dr. Portnoy intervened and made sure that we got a pain consult. Um, we needed a pain consult because the ophthalmologist was just going to prescribe um, Tylenol and codeine, and my husband couldn't tolerate that. And um, I heard one ophthalmologist say to another, she, me, insisted on a pain consult, but I think that's overkill because they are focused on the primary condition of the eye. And the fact is that there are other pain medications than codeine and Tylenol, and morphine worked. So, yes. It was a, a rare infection. I don't know. He, had, I, I don't know what it was called. It was a, it was a very rare eye infection. Have some respect for him, though, okay. What? Have some respect for him, <laughs> I didn't tell you his age and. Especially name to name. What else do you want to know about him? <laughs> okay. Okay, so, I mean, I mean, who is treated well? The old elderly are not treated well. The children are undertreated. Um, why are children undertreated? They're li less likely to be included in clinical trials. And why is that? There's a fear of adverse effects. Um, we recently concluded a, a trial of a drug called pomidronate for low back pain. Pomidronate binds to bone. We were advised strongly not to include anyone under the age of 21 in this trial because it could affect their bone development. And so you don't have the evidence-based um, information uh, for children as you have for adults. Um, so parents are less likely to provide informed consent, and there is the fear of legal liability. Also, if you think of it, you know, the percentage of the population who are under the age of 21 is much smaller than the percentage of those who are 21 and over. So if you're thinking in monetary terms, a pharmaceutical company would rather invest <clears throat> in a drug that's going to sell to more people and they'll make more money. Finally, <clears throat> in very young children, it's difficult to assess pain. Even children who are six years old and who are verbal, they'll be cranky and they won't tell you that something hurts them. You'll think it's just another cranky day. So these are reasons that children are undertreated. Um, this, this kind of um, summarizes some of the things that we said, that um, pain increases with age. And from the age of 31 and onward, women are more likely to have pain of most conditions than men. And the prevalence of, of the conditions, the conditions that this holds for, range from general headache, to mouth pain, neck pain, abdominal pain, fibromyalgia. Women are between one and a half and four and a half times as likely to have these types of pain than men. Now, um, part of the reason is that they're treated differently. Uh, female sex is predictive of inadequate pain management. How many of you are saying, yes, yeah, sure? I don't believe that. 
I mean, I, I, I kind of felt that, but I'll come to a one where I'll show you that it's, it's, it is really true. Women's pain reports are taken less seriously, and they are treated less aggressively. So a couple of, a few, well, more than a couple of years ago, there was a major study um, that showed that women, the elderly, and ethnic, racial and ethnic minority patients were significantly under-treated for pain compared to others in the population. Right, so 45 to 65-year-old men get, get pain treatments. <laughs> White men. <laughs> White men. <laughs> Okay, so why, if we, again, distributions, we're looking at the at differences that are related to sex and gender now. This age, race, sex, this is the gender part. There are a greater number of coping mechanisms for women. Uh, their pain is, all, is often discounted as being psychological. Here's one. Attractive individuals are often perceived as not in pain, and women have been socialized to attend more to their physical appearance. Um, so in 2005, my sister was very ill. She was 69 years old, and she had to have major surgery. And I went to visit her at the ICU. She wasn't awake. And knowing how ill she was, I still had a laugh inside of myself. A 69-year-old woman with not a single gray root. Her hair was lustrously brown. I mean, it was beautiful. She had a beautiful manicure. She had a perfect manicure, a perfect pedicure. Looking at her, you would never know how sick she really was. Take a man. It's come as you go, come as you are. If you bring your toothbrush, great. There's nothing masking how terrible you feel and how sick you are. So when I saw that, um, I, I stopped discounting this reason for women being treated less aggressively. They just don't look as sick. And then men... Uh, because of cultural influences, tend to be more stoic. So if they do finally complain about pain, um, more attention is paid to it. And they seek pain relief, at a, they delay, so that they're at a later stage of their condition, which is and usually more serious, and so they really need more aggressive pain treatment. It's going to be very interesting generationally to think, think this through in different generations because I think that 60, 70 year old men are very different than 20 and 30 year old men mm -hmm. and even because, because there's been an emphasis on the way you look and bodybuilding and taking care of yourself. So it would be very, very interesting to see right. whether this is congruent between generations because it may not, may not be anymore. Right. Men may be very concerned about the way they look. Right. Younger men. Right. So it's just we need to think about generational differences. That's true. Right. Yeah, and body image, like you said. Absolutely. That yeah. might be right. Right. Okay, so that's another part of epidemiology is secular trends yeah. and trying to figure out what hap why, why there is such a secular trend. Um, women seek pain, pain management uh, more often from alternative uh, medicine therapies and then do men. The, so that could also account for the difference in the proportion of pain and, and the pain reports. And they respond differently to treatment. Um, women consume less morphine via patient-controlled analgesia than do men. It could be something related to kappa opioid analgesia. We really don't know um, exactly why. But there is a paradox. If they have more intense pain, are they, you know, you'd think that they were hypochondriacs. But if they, you might think, but if they um, need less opioid for analgesia, then do they really have more intense pain? How do you reconcile those two facts? And it could be that um, males and females also different, are different in terms of uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of opioid treatment. What that means is that the patient uh, may do something different with the drug than the, man, than the man does. They may metabolize it more quickly or more slowly. And the other term refers to what the drug does to the person. The drug may bind more tightly to certain receptive, receptors in a male versus a female. So um, this is another possibility 
for why the for the differences in pain between the genders. Um, the most um, prevalent type of pain is spontaneous pain, which turns out to me, me, mean pain of unknown etiology, which is, I guess, disconcerting. And um, in the study that was done in 1986, we have a graph here that is consistent with what we said initially. The most prevalent types of pain are back uh, headaches and joint pain, where leg pain would be a part of that. Um, pain intensity, um, about the mild to discomforting is about 55% versus 45% of people who have chronic pain uh, reported to be distressing, horrible, and excruciating. So um, what I was supposed to tell you in the first slide, and I forgot, was that the um, prevalence of pain and the proportion of people who have pain um, is greater than the proportion who have heart disease, cancer, and diabetes altogether. But these three other diseases and conditions are life-threatening. Um, pain is usually not life, not life-threatening, but it could be distressing, horrible, and excruciating. And so um, we have to pay attention to it because it has implications for disability, which Laura will talk about, and general quality of life. And most people who have chronic pain have had it for more than three years. Two-thirds of them have had it for more than three years. And that's what we're talking about, the accrual of, uh, to the pool of chronic pain. When you get it, you keep it. And those who have chronic pain have it often. They have it continuously or daily for the most part. This is missing. Oh, thank you. So th these are 1986 data. Keep in mind that um, pain medicine was not a subspecialty at that time. And at that time, um, the, the people who, who uh, looked at, uh, at the professionals who are consulted for pain found that physicians predominantly treat almost all pain, and a distant second was chiropractors. So I recently conducted a study where I looked at primary care physicians, pain physicians, chiropractors, and acupuncturists, and I found uh, that the study suggested that just a little bit of half of pain is um, treated, pain patients are treated by primary care physicians, followed very closely by chiropractors, 40% uh, and 7% by acupuncturists. So complementary medicine is really catching up. And where are the pain physicians? They take care of only 2% of pain patients. Can anybody tell me why that might be so? Because there are no pain physicians. There are no pain physicians, right. And of the pain right. physicians, mo what? <laughs> right, <laughs> right, they're predominant. Do you know that, how about how many there are in the, in the country? Like 700,000. Is it? 1 million two or so What are you talking about? How many there are overall? No, pain, pain physicians. Pain physicians. 1 million two or so? 9,000. About about yeah. three thousand, and and, th and and three quarters of them are anesthesiologists. I don't know. I don't know. We don't have a million people. Go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and well, uh, and pain physicians may. That's one reason there aren't many pain physicians. But then, not all pain uh, illnesses need to be treated by pain physicians. Um, primary care physicians should be able to treat a lot of pain conditions. The truth is that they have great deficiencies in the knowledge of pain treatment that they should have. Uh, they're, they're, they're missing out on a lot, and, and that is a problem that needs to be addressed. Brenda, can I have you just comment on your Journal of Clinical Oncology publication? And was this planned? This was not was planned. planned. <laughs> I'm Brenda's biggest fan, but she wants to tell you about this study. Um, I just had a, a paper accepted for the, to the Journal of Clinical Oncology in which we surveyed uh, 2,000 medical oncologists across the country. And part of the survey uh, we, was uh, two vignettes about um, common prevalent, 
cancer conditions uh, where we portrayed patients and um, described them and there was multiple choice as to what the responders could pick as appropriate treatment for these patients. And in one case, 87% checked unacceptable choices. And in another case, 60% checked unacceptable choices. And one of the sad things is that they hardly referred to pain specialists or palliative care specialists. So um, this, this is a, a true problem. And again, it's focusing on, on the condition that you were trained to treat. So the overall summary of the epidemiology of pain thus far is that the, prevalent, there's pre, the pain prevalence among households is one in three. It's one in five among individuals. It increases with age. Women have more of it. Back pain is the most common problem. Um, the cause of pain is usually unknown. 45% uh, have severe excruciating pain. Um, the majority receive care from a medical practitioner. However, um, more and more complementary clinicians are providing pain treatment and the survey results in the United States are consistent from the data from other countries. Thank you. All right, I'm Laura Dingra. I'm a clinical psychologist here in the Department of Pain Medicine and Palliative Care. Um, though I'm a clinical psychologist, my role here in the department has been to develop and implement a program of clinical research and so if any of you are interested in research opportunities or want to discuss different projects that are ongoing in the division, um, I'd be very open to that at any point during the year. So I thought that was really fantastic, Brenda. Thank you. I'm going to focus my part of the lecture on the enormous health-related expenditures, um, both due to medical costs as well as non-medical costs that chronic pain presents in our society. So the first study I wanted to highlight uh, was entitled Chronic Pain in the Workplace and it was a 10-year update comparing results from a 1996 survey of the impact of chronic pain in the workplace to a 2006 update. So as many of you are well aware in this room persistent pain has risen dramatically among full-time workers in the past 10 years Workers today, however, opt to go to their jobs instead of staying home and calling in sick. This kind of a trend is known as presenteeism. There was a 38% rise in chronic pain among U.S. full-time workers between 1996 and 2006. So this was a national survey, I should mention, uh, in 1996 that was uh, um, conducted by um, Harris Interactive Group and um, the follow-up survey was studied uh, was sponsored by, by Pricara uh, which is a division of ortho and that was done in 2006 and it really in, uh, in indicated there was a significant impact of chronic pain on productivity and that um, there was a strong need for management um, particularly of moderate to severe pain in adults. Um, I should add that this was a very large study. Um, don't have the N, but it was, um, it was a very large study. So in the past 12 months, so in the past year, they found that there was a 27% rise between 1996 and 2006 in the number of employees who called in sick for five or more days directly as a result of pain. 65% of employers, they also surveyed employers in this study, cited that pain-related conditions were a major cause of lost productivity in the workplace. So um, some of you may be aware that worksite wellness programs have increased uh, by 65% um, between 1996 and 2006. Um, though these days I don't know that there are that many of them. Um, Terry might have no. 
um, only 22 percent of these programs that were surveyed um, in 2006 addressed how to manage, live with, or prevent chronic pain. So you can see there's a gap there in terms of what these programs may, may address. 95% of employees, almost all employees, said pain must be moderate to very severe in order to stay home. 89% um, of full-time employees with chronic pain said they typically go to work. So this might be very different than the population of patients that you're providing care to in a tertiary care pain setting. And as you can see, it may not be, your experience may not be reflective of the general population. That's true. You're seeing the, the ones who are most disabled and probably um, most likely unemployed or underemployed due to their pain. Almost all, 80... So mm -hmm. to other factors. Mm -hmm. They may have been unemployed. That's very true. Because of the nature of the community that we work in. It's very true. It's, it's, it, it's yes. multivectorial, and you'd have to do a sort of a pre-pain onset survey versus a post-pain. So it's a great point. 90% of, almost 90% of full-time employees with chronic pain uh, experience their pain while they work. And about half, 46% of employees with chronic pain, said pain can often or sometimes affect their ability to perform their job. So here there can be deficits in their performance related to chronic pain. So I want to talk about an important public health issue. Um, this is of a great um, import um, as we have a large number of veterans um, who have served in particular in Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Since 2001, there have been 1.6 million people who have served in either Operation Enduring Freedom or Iraqi Freedom. And an increasing number of those who have served um, will survive their injuries. It used to be that you could die on the battlefield, but these days, you're more likely to survive because of rapid response to the field. So as a result, all of you who are taking care of patients, this will be a big component of your population in, in years to come. Uh, people who have survived uh, blast injuries, other traumatic injuries who develop neuropathic pain uh, will increasingly be the patients you encounter. Uh, do any of you know what percentage of people who've served in either Iraqi freedom or enduring freedom are discharged or no longer are separated from the military. Just take a guess. What percentage of people who they don't have to serve anymore? They they are no longer affiliated with the military after doing those tours. Fifty percent. So these are people who are now most likely reintegrating back in to society and will in fact uh, be going back to their homes and and so they in fact um, will be uh, seeking care and most of them do not come to the VA. Less than 50 percent come to the VA for their care. So you'll be seeing them in tertiary care pain settings, primary care settings uh, that are outside the VA. So an online survey was conducted in 2006 that was sponsored by the American Pain Foundation 753 veterans or members of the military replied to this survey and the majority, a subset of 721, indicated that they were in pain. So you can see there was um, an overwhelming bias here among those who responded that they in fact had pain. What percentage of that did it go out to? I mean 753 of how many? Yeah, I don't know how many they tried to contact. We can include that for next time. Okay. Thanks for that question. So not surprisingly, there was a key finding that pain is a major issue. Of the 753 who responded, 96% reported pain. More than half, 54%, reported they'd had it for more than 10 years. And 64% reported their pain was directly related to their military service. This is an important statistic because uh, it can, in fact, um, relate to how your costs, medical costs, and care associated with pain uh, is reimbursed by the military. If it's a service-connected 
condition versus a non-service connected condition, and it can often be a hard thing to document. Pain intensity was very high, uh, about 70% or three quarters rated their daily pain intensity on a scale from zero to 10 as between seven and 10. So this you know, pain that's seven or 10 is an index of really severe pain. And psychiatric comorbidity was common. 66% uh, suffered from major depressive disorders, 34% or more than a third had post-traumatic stress disorder, and about a third, 29%, had pain, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. So these are complex medical comorbidities. Many of them co-occur. This can have serious implications on uh, outcomes such as adherence to pain management, the ability to cope with pain or adjust with, to pain, um, and, and certainly um, you know, can, can make the management um, much more difficult. Uh, I should mention that RAND had a study about two or three years ago that showed, it was called the Invisible Wounds of War. Some of you might be familiar with it. About 30% also have traumatic brain injury, and this can have serious medical and psychosocial sequelae. Um, recently, this has been getting more attention in the news. One in four people who commit suicide have served in either Iraqi freedom or enduring freedom. Now, it's not clear whether these suicides were due to potentially accidental overdose with opioids or other analgesic use uh, for those where there's, you know, um, uh, a drug uh, analgesic involved. You know, other people have had more um, uh, invasive um, or um, traumatic um, causes of death. So the bottom line is this is um, a problem chronic pain that can interfere quite substantially with quality of life. Um, as you can see here, 73% reported that it impacted very much or interfered with their quality of life substantially. 69% said it interfered very much with their ability to work. 54% said pain interfered very much with their social relationships with other people. Um, it's important to kind of recognize the context with which pain occurs, as Terry mentioned, the life that someone led uh, before the onset of pain may in fact be a strong contributory factor to their adjustment of pain, their expression for pain, their treatment seeking for pain. Training to be tough is oftentimes ingrained as part of the military culture and it may be a barrier to pain care. 32 percent felt that asking for pain treatment compromised their status as a member of the military or their career in the military. This is a really striking finding. 48 percent felt their training to be stoic or to inhibit the expression of their pain, um, you know, not to be open about it, to kind of suppress it, was a barrier to their pain care. So these kinds of influences, these socio-cultural contextual influences, as a psychologist I'm very interested in, um, you don't see this in just military, and this of course is a generalization, right? It may not be true of all people in the military, but you see it in other groups as well. Brenda mentioned that elderly adults, um, I do research in Chinatown with the ethnic Chinese population who are first generation, non-English speaking, uh, primarily from the Canton province. We find that stoicism is very high um, for religious, spiritual, um, gender related reasons. So um, it's not just the uh, biology of pain that contributes to pain experience. Only 6% rated their pain care to be very effective. 15% rated their pain care as very ineffective. 15%. 62%, more than half, rated their pain care as moderately effective. So what, can, what would be some contributory causes to this? Um, is it the adequacy of care? Is it adherence with their pain regimen? Um, is it uh, provider related? Is it system related in terms of their access to care? Um, so these are important questions that we, we strive to understand in our research. Uh, parenthetically, we tried to do a study of pain in community dwelling adults who'd been discharged from Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom. We had funding for the study, but we could not do it because to, in order to survey those adults who had served, you need their names, phone numbers, addresses. That is all classified information by the Department of Defense. So it was very, very, it's very, very difficult to study the, uh, the extent or the prevalence or epidemiology of pain in this population. So let's talk about cost. 
Everybody's concerned with cost, right? Um, so the cost of low back pain is enormous. Uh, up to 80% of U.S. adults um, are affected by back pain at least once in their life. Um, it is a leading reason for physician office visits, hospitalization, surgery, and work disability. So it's among the most common reasons that a person will visit their family physician. Estimates of the total annual combined costs of back pain related medical care and disability range from 20 billion to 50 billion in the United States and this was done in 1990. I guarantee you it's even larger now. If any of you are interested and we'll include this, sorry we didn't now, the Institute of Medicine documented the costs in their report. A small percentage of patients with persistent low back pain, however, only five to nine percent of those, um, five to nine percent of patients with low back pain account for most of the costs, 50, uh, 65 to 85 percent of the costs. So you can see that it's a low number that are the highest utilizer uh, of services that are the most expensive. So this might sound familiar to you, right? The patients you you, you see that maybe have the most complex problems or, the most, or are most likely to utilize uh, health care services usually account for the greatest proportion of costs. Um, lost work time because of back pain declined actually by 32% between 1994 and 1998. Um, but there has been an increase in lost work time due to lo low back pain between 1998 and 2000. And we don't have updates on these statistics. Um, these were pretty comprehensive. Um, data that were done. Um, so in terms of the cost of low back pain, um, in terms of work, um, low back pain, as you know, poses an economic burden uh, to our society, mainly in terms of a large number of work days that are lost by a small percentage of patients who develop it. So again, the annual cost of lost work time, as you can see in this slide, that's associated with low back pain was estimated at, and you can see here we have it for men and women, $1,230 for men and $773 for women. This, however, translates in 1987 dollars to an annual productivity loss of $28 billion. So let's talk about um, another um, prevalent pain problem, arthritis or chronic joint related symptoms. The estimated prevalence of arthritis or chronic joint symptoms among U.S. adults in 2001 was 33 percent. I think one of you had mentioned that this is something that um, is very common, uh, particularly as people age, it may become more prevalent. Prevalence increased with age and women had a higher prevalence than men. Um, arthritis and chronic joint problems comprise the leading cause of disability among adults in the US and as the population ages you know the population of elderly adults by 2050 uh, will more than I think double uh, the cost of this is going to increase exponentially so who's going to pay for all this <laughs> the cost of osteoarthritis OA um, can be a very disabling condition. Majority of people, like most patients with pain, will go to their primary care provider. You, as pain specialists, will see the people that uh, following surgery or following uh, first and second line treatments from their primary care don't improve in terms of function and uh, quality of life and pain intensity. So the estimated cost of osteoarthritis is estimated to be almost 90 billion a year. Um, and job-related osteoarthritis, this means that osteoarthritis was incurred based on a job-related injury, um, perhaps due to trauma, um, and you could develop it later in life. It may not happen right away. So this is certainly could be an insidious um, problem. Is estimated to comprise about 9% or 8.3 billion of all those expenditures. So job-related injuries. Uh, account for about 9%. About 51% of job-related costs um, result from medical costs and 49% um, from lost productivity at work and at home. 
The investigators who did this particular study in 1994, so I should mention that all of this, the monetary value here is in 1994 dollars, speculated that we are really likely to underestimate the true costs because we ignore the true burden related to um, indirect costs such as family member, caregiver time, people who maybe have to stay at home to take care of a person who's uh, disabled due to OA. Um, we can't measure the impact on quality of life um, and uh, certainly um, that can cause enormous suffering as well. Um, this particular slide compares those with rheumatoid arthritis to those with osteoarthritis to those with no type of arthritis. Um, and you can see from this slide um, on the left axis is the average cost over one year for medical costs due to these problems. Compared with persons who've never had a diagnosis of arthritis, patients with rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis incur statistically significantly more direct health charges. Uh, in this particular study, and I've labeled the numbers on each of the bars, the average direct charges medically related were $3,802 dollars for the cohort with rheumatoid arthritis, 2,655 for the osteoarthritis cohort, while those who were in the community who never had a diagnosis of arthritis, the cost were 1,388. So you can see here that there's um, a large disparity in terms of costs. So what are, what do we mean by indirect costs of arthritis? Well, um, Disease-specific um, indirect and non-medical costs are substantial. Um, and we can see here the table shows rheumatoid arthritis patients, osteoarthritis patients, and patients without any arthritis. So uh, this was a postal survey um, that was conducted in a community-based sample of patients, or persons with uh, either of these three um, classifications. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis, or OA, and you can see this in the first um, bullet here, required uh, three times more days of care for their condition compared with those with no arthritis and had more expenses for home care or child care and other expenditures, that's the third line here, such as medical equipment, assistive devices, or home remodeling. In addition, patients with rheumatoid arthritis were more likely to have lost their job, retired early, or reduced their work hours or stopped working entirely because of their illness. They were also three times more likely to have a reduction in household family income than those with osteoarthritis or no arthritis. Uh, importantly, 15% and 9% of people with RA and OA respectively were unable to get a job because of their illness compared with 5% of those with no arthritis. So the investigators in this study also found that functional status and pain scores, um, as well as the presence of RA or OA, were significant predictors of cost and health care utilization. So let's talk about musculoskeletal conditions more, um, more broadly here. A 1996 study found that 54 million people had a musculoskeletal condition, at least one. Uh, this represents 20% of the U.S. population. However, these 20% with musculoskeletal conditions account for 38% or 193 billion dollars of all medical expenditures in the U.S. I think that's staggering. Um, in 1996, uh, per capita medical care among people with medical conditions averaged 3,000 dollars 578 that's not on this slide but I wanted to mention that to you and that nationally was the equivalent to 193 billion dollars this is 2.5 percent of the gross domestic product in uh, in 1996 uh, the most um, the most the, the reasons for these causes were uh, these costs were mainly due to hospital admissions, physician visits, and prescriptions. 
A total of 39 billion was directly attributable to musculoskeletal conditions. Um, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, musculoskeletal conditions account for more than one in three of the total cases of lost work time. Six musculoskeletal conditions are among the top 20 most costly physical health conditions for employers. So in terms of the work-related costs of pain, um, you know, employers um, really encounter a significant fi financial loss um, due to the costs of pain. Um, this study showed um, that medical costs account um, for less than half of the total health and productivity related expenditures that employers face, however. So a random sample of 13,254 employed and 856 unemployed adults aged 18 to 65 was completed between 2001 and 2002. And you can see here that $80 billion a year was cost to U.S. employers from lost productivity due to pain. And um, the conditions that were studied were very common. Uh, arthritis accounted for uh, a loss of 5.9 hours on average per week of, product of productive time, 5.8 hours for back pain per week, 3.6 hours for headache pain per week, and 6.6 .6 hours for other mus musculoskeletal conditions. Um, so the way they calculated lost productive, productive time uh, was um, by looking at the dollars um, per worker per week um, using self-reported annual salary, and they generalized this to the U.S. workplace, and that's how they, they got the $80 billion. Right. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if anybody can mm -hmm. actually address this, but when people gather information on quest, I assume that they go to third-party insurers and Medicare. But now with doctors opting out of everything, I wonder how good mm. the estimates of costs are. That's a really good point. Yeah, I, I would really, um, I would really like to look that up because I think that's a significant problem. You know. Um, so I just want to skip um, just to a few points um, in the interest of time. Um, in this particular study, um, well, I'll get to this in a minute. As many of you know, um, in terms of cancer-related pain, because we spent a lot of time on low back pain, musculoskeletal pain, um, the prevalence of moderate to severe cancer pain is estimated to be about 30 to 50 percent among those in active treatment, 70 to 90 percent in those with advanced disease. And we know that unrelieved cancer pain affects the lives of patients and their families in many ways. Um, this particular study showed that it decreased quality of life, functionality, activity, appetite, and productivity, which often resulted in patients' unwillingness to continue active treatment for their cancer. Uh, when pain was relieved, patients and families incurred only costs associated with treatment, which was typically pharma pharmacotherapy. When the pain was unrelieved, however, patients frequently required visits to the ED, which may have resulted in expensive inpatient admissions. And when a patient's in pain crisis, um, as many of you know, direct medical costs are high. Direct and indirect non-medical costs are also high due to intangible effects of pain and suffering. Um, patients, in fact, may develop uh, passive suicidal ideation as a consequence of unrelieved pain. Um, this is not just um, uh, representative of the cancer pain population. We see this in the non-cancer pain population as well. Um, there have been studies that shown that unrelieved pain is associated with passive suicidality, hopelessness, um, as well as depression. Uh, Dr. Portnoy and uh, Barry Fortner uh, did a study uh, in 2002 that was published in the Journal of Pain where they surveyed 1,000 cancer patients by telephone um, to determine the occurrence or epidemiology of breakthrough pain. As you know, it can be a very, very disabling uh, problem. They looked at uh, pain-related hospitalizations from breakthrough pain, emergency department visits, and physician office visits. 16% of the total sample 
um, including 63% of those who are taking around-the-clock or scheduled analgesics experienced breakthrough pain. As you can see here from the graph, the estimated total cost per patient for those with breakthrough pain was $12,000 per year, compared with $2,400 per year with patients without a history of breakthrough pain. And this is probably largely due to those types of uh, pain-related hospitalization visits, emergency department visits, and physician office visits that I mentioned. So we are about out of time, and I just wanted to ask if there were any questions related to either my or Brenda's portion of the lecture.